Hello, and I'm glad you could join me for this episode of Lights Out, your virtual campfire. I'm your hostess with the mostest ghosties, Sylvia Schultz. Quick, think of a Chicago gangster. Who popped into your mind first? I'm willing to bet that it was Al Capone. Even before the untouchables, Capone was a legendary figure in the Chicago mob, the very epitome of gangsterhood in the 1920s. He was the head of a ruthless gang of outlaws, the mastermind behind the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. But Capone had a softer side, too. Channeling an inborn Italian drive to feed everyone, Capone was the driving force behind many of the soup kitchens that helped Chicago's poor survive the Great Depression. Al Capone died in Florida in 1947 of syphilis, but he came home to Chicago to be buried. And I am so pleased, as a fan of Chicago history, that he is buried in a cemetery that is just 15 minutes from where I grew up. Grab your recorders and EMF meters, and let's go lights out. The first time I visited Al Capone was completely by accident. It was cold and rainy, and the two white teddy bears that guarded Capone's grave were soaked to the stuffing, poor little things. Capone's grave is easy to find. As you go up Wolf Road through Hillside, Mount Carmel will be on your left at the stoplight of Wolf Road and Roosevelt Road. Turn left, and the cemetery entrance will be on your right. Go right again at the first lane, and on your right will be a large gray marker with the surname Capone on it. Now, what the books tell you is that Al Capone's marker is very simple. Just the name, Alphonse Capone, the dates 1899 to 1947, and the plea, My Jesus, Mercy. What the books don't tell you is that Al's stone, which is actually a small rectangle of marble flush with the ground, is one in a long line of Capone burials, all with a name, two dates, and the phrase, My Jesus, Mercy. Along with Scarface himself, you can find Mother Teresa Capone, and father, Gabriel Ralph James Capone, who lived from 1894 to 1974. Obviously, this is not Al's father. He's someone's father, though. There's even a Mary Martin Capone, who lived from 1918 to 2004. Imagine that, a relative of Al Capone's who lived into the 21st century. The second time I stopped by to visit Al... I had a bit more time on my hands, so I decided to do an EVP session at his grave. November 11th, 2018. I'm standing at the grave of Alphonse Capone, 1899 to 1947. My Jesus Mercy. Might be a little hard to get any EVPs here because I'm standing next to a very busy street. But we'll see what happens. So, Al, you're still like the most famous gangster who ever lived. Everybody knows Al Capone's name. How do you feel about that? I notice here on your stone, well, first of all, you've got flowers, which is nice. I see that people have, looks like the edges of your stone are chipped. Is that because people have chipped off bits for souvenirs? Nobody else's stone is chipped. Is that what happened? 
Al, people still remember you. Just wanted to let you know that. People remember you for being a Chicago gangster. You go anywhere in the world and you say you're from Chicago, people will say, Oh, Al Capone! And they're going to make machine gun noises. Even today. And this is 2018. But you're also remembered for putting together soup kitchens. For those who were in need. That should make you proud that you're remembered for that too, does it? Does it make you happy to be remembered as a nice guy? Someone who helped out the less fortunate? Well, Mr. Capone, what do you want to be remembered for? Al, what did you like to do for fun? What was your idea of a good Saturday night? Did you ever feel any regret about becoming a gangster? Or did you just consider yourself a businessman? You saw a need and you filled it, is that right? Mr. Capone, is there anything else you'd like to say to me? If you'd like to say anything, now's your chance. Okay, well, thank you for talking to me. If you stand with your back to Al's grave, on your left and across the lane a bit will be the grave of Frank Nitty, one of Scarface's enforcers. His stone says Nitto, the family name, but make no mistake, that's old Frank Nitty buried there. I did a bit of recording at his grave site, too. Standing at the grave of Frank Nitto. We know him better as Frank Nitty, Capone's enforcer. His headstone says 1888 to 1943. Rest in peace. Now, when Nitty was indicted and realized he was going to go to jail, he walked down to the railroad tracks and he put a bullet through his skull. Was it worth it, Frank? 
Did you not want to go to jail that badly that you felt you had to kill yourself? Car just went by. I've seen your crime scene photos. I've seen photographs of your dead body. Pretty gruesome. Another car. Had you killed so many people that you thought it was okay to kill yourself? Frank, is there anything you want to say to me? You know, your boss is buried over there. Just a few hundred feet away from us. Is there anything you want to say to Al Capone? He died just four years after you did. He didn't commit suicide, though. He died on his own. Is there anything you want to say to Mr. Capone? Is there anything you want to say to me? Okay, well, I'm going to go do other things. Thank you for talking with me. I am now headed to Section 19 to see the DeSalvo tombstone, which rotates. Looking around at all of the stones in this section of the cemetery, I was struck by the incredible variety of Italian last names. I did not realize there was such a variety of Italian last names. I see Catramboni, Schiacotta, Sibilano, Catino, Ranzula, Pasquale, Avalone, Ricci, Shulo, Spina, Fanelli, Lenzini, Andriacci, Lucente, Rattini, Chiodo, Zaccari, Taliasferi. Just a really really wide variety of names. Siciliano, well that's kind of a given. Perillo, Pecoraro, Vaco, Bomicino, Palermo, Scumaci, Salatore. Really interesting variety of names. visiting the gangsters and stopping for a peek at the huge obelisk that marks Dean O'Banion's grave. There are a lot of gangsters buried at Mount Carmel. I visited the elaborate grave marker of the DeSalvo family. 
This family portrait in stone is supposed to be set up so that it pivots on its base, but I couldn't get it to turn. And, well, I didn't want to force it. The DeSalvo family stone kind of weirds me out the more I think about it. It's obviously a snapshot of the entire family, carved, as far as I can tell from the fashions, to represent the family at the end of the 19th century. I'd guess about 1880 to 1890. The moment is frozen in time, but you know that the young people in the tableau grew up and changed fashions and grew old and didn't look like that anymore after a while. I don't know why this should weird me out. It just sort of does. I did notice something very interesting to me personally, though, and I hope I can explain it adequately. The thing about Mount Carmel Cemetery is that it is jam-packed with gravestones that have old photographs on them of the people buried there. These photos are especially prevalent in the Italian section in a time frame roughly from 1910 to 1940. Now, I used to have a recurring nightmare where I'd be walking or driving along and all of a sudden I'd find myself in the middle of a cemetery and all the stones would have these pictures on them, and I'd feel, I don't know, like the dead people were looking at me or something. But I have not had that dream since my long visit to Mount Carmel. I think maybe that immersion therapy worked, and I'm no longer nervous about pictures on gravestones since I saw so many of them that day. It is really tough, though, to look at a gravestone and see a picture of a child. It really makes you wonder about some of the stories here. Here's a stone for Seriale that has two young women on it. Oh, okay. A young woman and a baby. They're both named Jesse. Jesse the Younger lived from 1944 to 1945 and Jesse the older lived from 1925 to 1941 so it just makes you wonder I guess I guess that's backwards I guess the first Jesse died in 1941 and the second Jesse was born in 1944 it looks like that's what happened is this parents these parents had two daughters Named them both Jesse. One lived for a while and the other lived for a very short while. And I wish I knew some more of these stories. There's a stone here that has a young fellow in a sort of a newsboy cap very jaunty smile on his face and he lived from 1911 to 1930 an Italian guy was he a gangster is that how he died in some sort of shootout well we don't know and speaking of photographs on gravestones Mount Carmel is also the final resting place of Giulia Bucola Petta also known as the Italian Bride. Giulia came to America from Palermo, Italy in 1913 with her family. She married Matthew Petta in 1920 when she was 29 years old and died in childbirth almost exactly nine months later. The baby, who didn't survive the birth either, was tucked into the crook of Giulia's arm and they were buried together very near the south gate of Mount Carmel. Women who died in childbirth were looked on almost as martyrs in Sicilian culture, so Julia was buried in her white wedding dress. There's a photograph on her tombstone, too, of her on her wedding day, holding her bouquet. Julia's is not the only gravestone in Mount Carmel to feature the wedding day picture of the woman buried under the stone. There are plenty of them. Julia's is, however, the only stone to have a second photograph on it, taken of Julia six years after she died. 
Before you get thoroughly grossed out, let me tell you the whole story. After Julie was buried, on March 19, 1921, two days after her death, her mother, Philomena, was utterly distraught. She said she had nightmares for years that Julia had been buried alive. She pestered her priest until, finally, six years later, he agreed to ask the bishop in charge of the parish for permission to exhume Julia's body. For whatever reason, the bishop agreed, and Philomena got her wish to see her daughter again. When the coffin was opened, everyone was stunned. The baby's fragile newborn body had crumbled to dust, but Julia looked almost fresh, with only a little swelling of her face and arms. Someone took a picture, and it's definitely a picture of an open coffin. You can see part of the lawn and a pile of dirt behind it, so the picture was taken right there. And that photograph was added to Julia's stone. Julia's brother Henry paid for the exhumation. Later, at Philomena's insistence, he commissioned a statue of Julia, which now stands atop her stone. This statue makes Julia's grave super easy to find. Also, it's very close to one of the cemetery entrances. Be aware, you're looking for a gravestone that says Julia Bucola, not Julia Bucola Petta. Apparently, Philomena despised Matthew Petta, probably blaming him for Julia's death. So Julia rests under her maiden name rather than her married name. For much more about Julia, including some juicy backstory about Philomena's personality, I encourage you to visit Adam Selzer's blog post about the Italian bride at the Order of the Good Death website. I drove all around Mount Carmel in the couple of hours I spent there. I probably got rubbish gas mileage because I kept stopping my car and hopping out to go investigate interesting-looking stones. I have to say that although Mount Emblem is the loveliest cemetery in Illinois, I'm biased, I have folks buried there, Mount Carmel is truly a delight to wander through. It's big. At one point I got completely turned around, and if it had been getting close to dusk rather than a bright sunny day, I'd have been freaking out a little. But I finally got my bearings and found my way out. I didn't really want to leave. I could happily have spent another two hours wandering the cemetery grounds. I hope you've enjoyed this visit to a very famous Chicagoland cemetery. Next time, we're going to go to another cemetery, one that's not quite as well known, but with loads more ghost lore. Please join me the next time we go Lights Out.